Hey everyone, welcome back to Curbside Consults, one of the podcast series at the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Clem, I'm one of the editorial fellows this year, and during my time at the journal, I thought it would be interesting and educational to do a dive into new guidelines that come out and speak with the people who contributed to them. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of interviewing Peter Merkel. He's the chief of rheumatology and a professor of medicine at Penn. He's known for his work in the field of vasculitis and took part in developing the latest guidelines for ANCA-associated vasculitides put out by the ACR earlier this year. I will also add that he has a larger-than-life personality that is appreciated by both his patients and colleagues. Dr. Merkel, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Since we have different levels of learners listening to the podcast, can you quickly review the ANCA-associated vasculitides, what they are, and why we categorize them that way? So we categorize vasculitis as large vessels, medium vessels, and small vessels, more or less. ANCA-associated vasculitis is a family or a group of three different diseases that are similar and linked. Granulomatosis polyangiitis, or GPA, microscopic polyangiitis, or MPA, and eosinophilic granulomatosis, or eGPA. So they get a little confusing. And these are small vessels So they tend to hit a variety of specific organs and patterns of disease. And all the vasculitides are generally considered rare diseases, but as a group, they're not that rare, and they are organ and life-threatening in many cases. Thank you for that overview. As someone who has never taken part of guideline development, sometimes it seems like a process that is a little opaque to me. Can you break down what generally happens behind the scenes for a guideline to be developed? The way it works is one team will review the literature in a standardized fashion. Another will oversee the overall projects, and then some of us are on the voting panel who offer opinions. And there's stages that go through of looking at the evidence, grading the evidence. Is it strong? Is it medium? Or is it kind of weak? Are we basing it on good clinical trial data or on people's experience? All of which is important, but we like to use the best possible data we can. And we like to let the readers know, are these recommendations based on very strong moderately strong or somewhat not so strong weak data. And so they can make their decisions based on that. And guidelines are just that. They're guidelines for how to approach a case and treat, but they're not absolute rules because patients are different and unique and you have to adapt the guidelines. I imagine for a rare disease like vasculitis, it might be hard to get really strong evidence for all the questions you're trying to answer. Can you give the listeners a gestalt of how much of the evidence was strong or what types of evidence you were drawing from? So overall, most of the recommendations we made were what we called conditional, meaning they're good, but necessarily great evidence. And the reason for that is in a rare disease, especially ankylosis vasculitis, for example, we've done some very nice international randomized, even double-blind controlled trials, sort of the best type of trials. But we tend to do one for one drug and another one for the next thing and answer each question with one trial. In a more common disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis or coronary artery disease, diabetes, you may have multiple trials for an individual drug or an individual question. And so you get more confidence from there. We have good data, and compared to 20 years ago, we have great data because we didn't have any of these trial results. So it's good level for many of these decisions we're making, but not as strong as in the more common diseases. However, we try to bring to the reader. What's the best we have so they can make the most educated decision? Thank you for that. And reading through the guidelines, it seems like this one was special and that it also had quite a bit of input from patients with vasculitis. Can you speak a little about how that was set up? Yes. So patients were involved in the review process from the beginning or from a relatively early stage. And the reason we want patient input is because the whole goal is to treat patients and improve their lives. And what patients bring is their perspective as patients for the burden of disease, the relative balance of the toxicities that may occur, and the questions and concerns they have. And these are patients, unfortunately, experienced with these diseases, and we worked with them, a separate group worked with them to help them bring. And when we were at the time of voting, they were voting as well. And so as someone who's worked fairly extensively with patients in a research environment, as partners in research and making guidelines, they uh, provide an invaluable voice as well. That's awesome. I really appreciate that. So let's just dive into some of the recommendations that were unique to this guideline for Inca-associated vasculitides. The guideline started off with induction therapy in the setting of life-threatening illness. 
As a generalist, I often think for bad vasculitis to reach for the big gun, cyclophosphamide. It seems like there is more of a push for rituximab now. Can you tell me more about that? So cyclophosphamide, also known brand cytoxin, I like to use the generic terms. Cyclophosphamide has been used since the 1970s for vasculitis. It was introduced in this family of diseases by none other than Dr. Anthony Fauci. He was the first to bring, well, others had done some of the work with cyclophosphamide. He was the first on a larger scale in his group to bring that and created the standard of care by using this chemotherapy-like drug for an autoimmune disease. It was a fairly novel approach, and it really set the standard for decades. Unfortunately, the drug works. It was much better than not having it, but it has long-term consequences and side effects, both short and long-term. And this is a disease that relapses, and so people were on cyclophosphamide over and over again, causing problems. So there's been a long desire to look to other therapies. Over 10 years ago, we conducted, I was part of the group that conducted the trial called RAVE, which stands for rituximab for anchor-associated vasculitis. And rituximab is a very different drug from cyclophosphamide. It is, we showed that it was equally efficacious, equally good in getting patients into remission. And other data that we and others have generated have shown that it's very good at keeping people in remission. It has become the standard of care because the toxicity of the drug, especially with long-term use, is less than with cyclophosphamide. Around the world, it depends on the availability of the drug. It is substantially more expensive than cyclophosphamide, so it depends on resources. That makes sense. Were there specific subsets of patients in the RAVE trial that still might benefit from cyclophosphamide, for example, patients with really severe disease? This is an area of much discussion. I would say there was a second trial called Rituxvas Europeans, but they were both published in the same issue of the New England Journal, by the way. And that also contributed to our understanding of the use of rituximab the FDA. Until two weeks ago, rituximab was the only drug approved for anchor-associated vasculitis. Cyclophosphamide was used because it was sort of an older drug that was adopted. So no trial includes the range of all patients, but there was no subset where we felt that it was not a good idea to use rituximab, perhaps more mild disease, but since then we have had a good experience with it. And so there's a lot of adoption for it. Although you could argue the very, very sick may have been excluded from the trial, there's also no trial-level data for, its, for the use of cyclophosphamide in such patients. And so some might say perhaps cyclophosphamide is stronger, but I don't think there's good data to support that statement. So the next portion of the guideline discuss plasma exchange, which historically was a first-line therapy. Plasma exchange, also known as PLEX. And to be honest, I don't really know the mechanism of it. Is it thought to bind antibodies? It seems like now there's a movement away from PLEX. Maybe you can talk about that? So plasma exchange or PLEX, it also goes by the name plasmapheresis, is a process by which a patient's blood, we actually put a big IV in, and their blood is run through a machine and the plasma is taken off. And then it's sort of removed the antibodies and then their blood is put back in their bodies. And then it's replaced with another substance so they don't lose their volume. It's a way of getting antibodies off. And the theory is you take off the bad humors, you take off the antibodies, and may be causing disease such as ANCA is an antibody. It has been shown to be useful in some diseases. It's been long controversial as to whether or not it's useful in ANCA-associated vasculitis. Some have been saying yes, some saying no. There was a uh, trial that showed it was useful for helping to prevent worsening kidney disease, although that trial only had very sick patients and long-term the follow-up didn't show a difference in survival, for example, which was surprising. There have been other studies. We did what we call a meta-analysis where we put together all the data in a complicated statistical way. We still couldn't come with a conclusion. Because of the controversy and uncertainty, actually, I was one of three principal investigators that ran an international trial called PEXIVAS, which was for plasma exchange in vasculitis. We always need a catchy name for a trial. And this was a very big international effort. We had multiple continents and nearly 100 sites around the world. It took 10 years to do this. And we randomized people to get plasma exchange or no plasma exchange. There was another part about the glucocorticoids as well. And what we found, and this was published in the New England Journal as well, I believe in February of 2020, we found no difference between people who got plasma exchange and people who didn't in terms of combined outcome of end-stage renal disease or needing dialysis or death. Big outcomes. Right now, based on the data and the guidelines, we would not routinely use plasma exchange, which is a change from what we've done before. And you mentioned in the PEXAVAS trial something about glucocorticoids. Can you elaborate on that? I like to say they're the best drugs we have. They're the worst drugs we have. They work very quickly 
to suppress inflammation but they also cause sleep problems and make people manic and they cause diabetes mellitus and infections and cataracts and glaucoma and heart failure and skin problems and they thin your bones and they cause death of bones. There's all sorts of complications. We know that the risk in treating new or relapsing ankle-associated vasculitis, the biggest risk to patients now is infection. And we think the glucocorticoids, steroids contribute to that. And so the PEXAVAS study and other studies that we can talk about. In addition to the plasma exchange part, we also randomized people to full dose glucocorticoids standard and then almost half as much. And it's a little more complicated recipe than that. But the idea was, can we get away with much less glucocorticoids, much less prednisone or prednisolone and still have the same efficacy without as much infection? And the answer is yes. The trial clearly showed that the two treatments full dose and the reduced dose were the same after one year and after several years. But the patients who got the lower dose of prednisone had fewer infections in the first year. And so this is a big win for patients and physicians because we can now use this lower dose regimen in most patients. Our next step is to go even lower and we can talk about that. I think all this talk about steroids and the risk of infection can bring us to our next question, which is around prophylaxis for patients with Inca vasculitides. I've heard about the high risk of PCP pneumonia. So can you speak a little bit about that and what sort of prophylaxis these patients should be on? The guidelines strongly suggest people prophylax against pneumocystis pneumonia. Exactly who should be prophylaxed is not always that clear. Our practice at our vasculitis center and in general is anybody who's on one of our immunosuppressive drugs in combination with glucocorticoids at a dose of, let's say, 20 milligrams or more per day should be prophylaxed. Once they're off the glucocorticoids or down to low dose, we often stop it depending on the drug. I had heard from an attending that there may be data in treating sinonasal localized GPA with trimethoprim sulfa. What's your take on that? The nose and sinuses are exposed to the world and are full of bugs. We have bugs everywhere in our body, especially in our mucous membranes and on our gut and our lungs. This is the microbiome that we all live with. The there is some data to suggest that it's possible that some of the flares of GPA, which especially likes the nose and sinuses, upper airway, or eGPA for that matter, could be triggered by an infection or a change in your microbiome. And there were some data, even a trial, where giving the same drug, trimethamine sulfamethoxyl, chronically may reduce the rate of recurrences of sinus and nasal disease. Some other data, some published or not, is not as strong. And this was before we were using some of the other drugs. So it is not routinely advised, but there are times that we use it in practice, I will tell you, at higher doses to prevent it. Thank you. That's very interesting. Let's move on to eGPA, which is a disease that seems to have many faces. Some patients may present similar to GPA, while others seem to be more atopic with more allergic symptoms. Can you describe our current thinking about eGPA and this paradigm shift in the guidelines? You're right. There are two groups. There are patients who are ANCA positive. About 40% of patients with eGPA will be ANCA positive with MPO, myeloperoxidase type ANCA. Those patients sort of look more like patients with GPA and MPA. They have more kidney disease, they have less heart disease, they look and act a little bit more, plus they have the asthma and the Those patients were more inclined to treat, sort of according to the guidelines I just mentioned, especially use rituximab. But I will tell you that we don't have strong data for that. We have case series and others part of, but we don't have the same level of confidence. There have been a few trials, sometimes open label trials, the French vasculitis study group did some in the 90s and 2000s, but the only big international multicenter trial was a trial of a newer agent, and it was mostly geared towards the upper airway disease and asthma. That's a drug called mepolizumab, which is blocking a chemical called IL-5, cytokine called IL-5. IL-5 does stuff to eosinophils, and so if you get rid of the IL-5, you still stimulate the eosinophils and their activity is much lower. And actually, if you give this drug, the eosinophils counts go way down. So the guidelines, the American College of Rheumatology Vasculitis Foundation guidelines, and this is, by the way, two groups that came together to endorse these, do think that mepolizumab, because it's effective and it's got very low toxicity, is a very good drug to consider in patients who have eGPA with asthma and upper airway disease that's not, for example, controlled by inhalers alone or who continue to use glucocorticoids. Again, remember we talked about the level of evidence? The level of evidence for mepolizumab is pretty good. It was a trial. It was one trial. 
the level of evidence for our other approaches to eGPA is not as strong. Perfect. Thank you. And you had alluded to this earlier about the Avacaban approval. Maybe you can speak a little about the drug and how it works. Sure. So Avacapan is a new drug in a new entire class of drugs. Avacapan is a pill that blocks the receptor for C5A. So complement 5A is a complement, this chemical that goes around your body that's very much involved. It's in the immune system and, and creating an immunologic response. It can be good for you to have complement to kill bugs and do other things. But in this disease, we think it's part of the problem that the C5A is involved in the inflammatory cascade that causes damage at the blood vessel level. The FDA has approved the drug for a uh, severe active ankyl-associated vasculitis, and I anticipate it will start being used for new or relapsing disease right up front. And if I would advise its use as we did in the trial, that's where the best data is. So I would start the drug and I would try to get people down on glucocorticoids much more rapidly than I would otherwise do. So I think this is only the second drug ever approved for ankyl-associated vasculitis. So it's a significant advance. Thank you for giving us a glimpse into the future of maintenance treatment might look like for vasculitis. Well, Dr. Merkel, are there any concluding remarks you might have or other things you think the listeners should know about? I do. I would say the most important part of treatment is close and regular clinical follow-up forever, essentially. This is diseases that can relapse for years and years. The other thing, there are many other variables that come into play. You need to talk about fertility and family planning is very important, weight control, bone disease, blood pressure, lipids, et cetera, all of which come into play because of their treatments and how they affect other aspects of your care. But I will leave you with this. We are much better at treating ankylosing vasculitis than when I started training in rheumatology several decades ago. This is a disease that used to kill people regularly. Unfortunately, some people still die from this, but it is now mostly a chronic, often recurrent disease where people can live full lives and do other things. So there's been a real change. We have more to go. We want better treatment. We want to get people off glucocorticoids altogether. We want to make sure people can have the families and lives they want, and we'd like to find a cure. Thanks, Dr. Merkel. That's very inspiring. I think that about wraps up this episode of Curbside Consults. I'd like to thank Peter Merkel for joining us today to discuss the latest ANCA vasculitis guidelines. Our production team at NEJM Resident 360 includes Karen Buckley, Lynn Winston-Perry, Kyle Simmons, Mike Thomases, Tim Vining, Scott Williams, and Kathy Stern. Also, a special thanks to our NEJM education editor, Dr. O.P. Hamnick. Curbside Consults is brought to you by NEJM Resident 360, a product of NEJM Group.